Hello and welcome back to Cloisterbell, a weekly Doctor Who podcast hosted by Liam and Rob. Hello everyone, Rob here and this week we're looking back at the legacy of time and this week it's part three, the sacrifice of Joe Grant. And Liam's here too, if you want to say hello to them Liam. Uh, no. No? No. No, he's in a bad mood today. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Now, what it is, uh, just before the uh, the podcast, we were just having quite a miserable catch-up. But it started off quite pleasant. And then I ended up talking about how I had a particularly horrible nightmare, which <laughs> ruined a night's sleep. And then that got us down the rabbit hole of just an incredibly depressing conversation. Yeah. But we're fine <laughs> now. We're raring to go. So, anything interesting happened today, Liam? You had the day off work. Yes, had a day, day off work because uh, I started um, started a new job. Um, I've been there for just over a month, but I pretty much hit the ground running. It's been incredibly busy. Uh, I'm loving the job, but I'm absolutely wrecked. Um, so uh, it's nice to to have a uh, just have a nice weekend. Uh, I've I've recently been uh, treating myself to. Um, buying some of the uh, James, James Bondy and Fleming books, but these are from the Folio Society. Um, so it comes with exclusive uh, illustrations and things like that. So I, I, I finished reading uh, Casino Royale. So yesterday I thought I'll watch the, the actual movie, uh, Daniel Craig's first one. So I watched that yesterday. That was really good. Because I have, I've only seen that probably two, three times. So it's not one that I'm overly familiar with. And it's, my God, it's good. It is, isn't it? Yeah. We, me and my wife just recently watched what a Daniel Craig marathon. But it took two nights to get through. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, it, it, it's 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 just really really good, and uh, it's. I mean, I've always liked it from the first moment I've seen it, but it's it's grown on me a lot more. Um, so that was quite nice, and today's just been quite relaxing, and um, I've finally finished listening to all of uh, the Blake Seven Liberator Chronicles from Big Finish. How many have you got? I've got all uh, all twelve volumes. Okay. Sure. Um. So I've been. I think. Oh, when did I start buying those? It was a few months back. So I've been slowly going through them, and um, so I went through. Uh, the final two episodes today: Capital and Punishment. Uh, funny enough, written by Guy Adams, who and this <laughs> it's as if this whole thing was planned. Who is the author for the Sacrifice of Joe Grant, which is the episode we're looking at today? Interesting. Yeah. Connections. <laughs> Connections. Yeah. Anyway, how about you? What have you been up to? Work, work. Yeah, pretty much guessed it. Been working all day. Oh. Yeah. And did you just listen to The Sacrifice of Joe Grant last night? Uh, yes, I did, yeah. Yeah, I gave it another listen last night. Um, and interestingly enough, I also tweeted that I was watching it. And we got a reply, didn't we? <laughs> yes, we did. And I went absolutely ecstatic when I see it. Do you want to tell them? Uh, yes, the, the absolutely wonderful Katie Manning actually responded. Um, I mean, telling us that she wasn't going to listen to the podcast. Thanks very much. But, uh, but uh, no, it was it was really sweet. Um, she, she was basically saying um, she hopes uh, we'll have a good conversation about it. Uh, she would actually love to listen to the podcast, but is in the middle of uh, moving at the moment. Um, yeah, so I thought, I thought that was tremendously sweet for, for Katie Manning to actually get in contact and... Uh, I got ridiculously excited when uh, when it popped up on the phone. Um, you know, obviously being being Doctor Who fans, but you know, th- you know, this childhood hero of yours, uh, just suddenly getting contact yeah. out of the blue. It was uh, it was really quite pleasant. Yeah. Well, I was at work, so I was having a bit of a bit of a miserable morning, and then went for my break, and I came back pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, that's nice. So um, yeah, uh, Katie Manning got in contact, and it was just a little thing, but. Uh, she managed to brighten our day up, which was quite nice. So, as you were saying, The Sacrifice of Joe Grant, written by Guy Adams. Mm-hmm. When pockets of temporal instability appear in the Dorset village, unit are called in. Soon, Kate Stewart and Joe Jones find themselves working alongside the third Doctor, while Osgood battles to get, get them home. Um, but this isn't the first time unit has faced this threat. Only before, it seems that Joe didn't survive. Did you think there was ever a question... Of whether or not Joe would die in this story. 
Um, to be honest, yes, I thought I, I yeah. thought that there would be. I mean, one that you've got the title, which is the sacrifice of Joe Grant, um, which is intriguing, and so that raises the possibility of it. And especially when you have, and going back to the televised series, when you've got uh, the demons, for example, where Joe at the end of the story is willing to sacrifice herself, um, to, you know, to save everyone. So it's sort of in keeping with that in keeping with her character from all those years ago. I mean, obviously she survives the demons, so you could say, well, arguably, wouldn't that mean she would survive this? But not necessarily. Um, and as the story progressed, there was there were certain things that were going, is is she going to die? Yeah. It, it only dawned on me near the end. I thought, would the death kill her off on audio? And I was thinking, maybe they would. Like a brave choice. <laughs> yeah, and I was just thinking, you know, yeah, because I thought that it would have been an incredibly brave choice. Um, and there's no reason why Big Finish wouldn't make that decision. And it's not as if um, they would just then stop doing the possibility of further Joe Grant stories. It could just, you know, it just be it was prior to the yeah. sacrifice of Joe Grant. Or maybe we just find out she was just a Zygon. Oh, oh, oh yes, yeah, I never thought. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the story kicks off with a field report from Alison mm-hmm. from the Countermeasures Group. Yeah. So this is the third podcast in a week where we've reviewed a story with her in. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and she reports that Joe um, is dead. Mm-hmm. Um, at first, I got a bit confused and I thought, and I confused Alison with Rachel. And then I thought, oh, is this where the doctor knows her from? In, in remembrance. Oh yes, that's a good point because we uh, when we were reviewing uh, Ramones of the Daleks in our previous yeah. podcast, uh, you actually you actually asked that question of yes. how because he says I'm sure I know you I'm sure I heard of you or yeah so actually um, yes that's something that I did notice hmm. and yeah that that's actually quite good so that's probably big finish doing that nice little tie in of yes that's well, well no no I'm saying wouldn't it be good if it was Rachel because it's actually Alison it's oh. the wrong character oh. sorry got your hopes up there. <laughs> <laughs> oh damn! All oh, right, yeah, you're right. Oh, that would be so now good. it makes less sense. <laughs> you know, he ha- he's met her. Ah, we'll well, no, go... no, no. Actually, because maybe Alison mentioned Rachel in in a, in a conversation that Big Finish haven't recorded yet. Ah, okay. So it does make sense. Perfect sense. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it would make sense because he he hadn't actually met her, but he heard of her. I'm mm-hmm. sure I've heard of you in remembrance. So actually, Rob, what you said does make sense. Perfect sense, yeah. yeah. I like it. Yeah, great. We'll stick with that. Yeah. It's quite <laughs> nice. Yeah. So the first scene is Osgood and Joe at the water park. Mm-hmm. So it's great, it's great to see them spending the time together. Um, Osgood is a big fan of the Doctor, so it makes sense that you'd associate with his friends. Yes, that's true. Um and although I haven't actually, as we've established in previous podcasts, I haven't listened to an awful, I haven't listened to an awful lot of the Doctor Who big finishes. Although I've, I have listened to an awful lot of the Blake Seven ones, um, it's becoming rather obligatory that I mention that in every podcast. Um, but I'm aware that of the the unit uh, audio adventures, and I know that uh, Osgood's in there, and Joe Grant has appeared in uh, one or two of them. So this is continuing off that, um, and I quite like that scene. Uh, at the beginning, I thought it was quite fun and nice, and um, not only did the characters, but the the actors themselves uh, spark off one another. Yeah, I like the um, the older Joe. Mm-hmm. I think. Have you seen Death of the Doctor? Yes, I have. Yes. Um, the promotional shot on, well, the picture of Joe on the box art for Legacy of Time is a promotional shot from that, mm-hmm. and I've used it for the cover art for this podcast too. Yes, yes, I thought I recognised it. But they could have, um, they could have, they could have featured a younger Joe. But do you like that they featured an older one? Yes, uh, I do actually. It was quite nice to have the char- uh, the character from all those, you know, much older. Um, and I really like how Katie Manning performs it. Um, I mean, because this is this is a fault of my own, but uh, I'm only really aware of, of Katie Manning through playing uh, Joe. I don't think I've seen her um, in any other performance. I really would like to. And actually, when I was listening to this audio adventure, 
one of the things I realised is, bloody hell, Katie Mang is a really good actress. And, you know, I think it's one of those things that perhaps, you know, you just take for granted because she played uh, Joe on television uh, in the 70s really rather well. Uh, and you just sort of you just sort of accept that. But, uh, I mean, I, I think this was because I was listening to her in, a, in an audio play uh, for the first time. And I was just bowled over by, by her performance. And even though the other actors involved are, you know, uh, excellent and really good, uh, for me it was Katie Manning who really sort of uh, shone. I really want to see more of her acting. And once again, because as with uh, the previous um, uh, the previous episodes of Legacy of Time, so we looked at Lies and Ruins, and that made me want to get into uh, the Bernice Summerfield audio adventures, and the Split Infinitive has wanted to get me into the countermeasures. God, the- this Legacy of Time is just a big money-making scheme, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's, it's just... Oh, big finish knew what they were doing. I'm going to be skint at the end of the year. Um, so this really, this is really what <laughs> me to uh, discover um, the 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 audio stuff that Joe Grant has, uh, uh, Katie Manning rather, uh, has has done. Because I know that um, not only has she done stuff with Joe Grant, but there's also another character whose name eludes me at the moment. Uh, I- I- Iris Welltime. Yes, that's it. Um, uh, I really want to listen to those now. Yeah. Her first appearance in Big Finish would be The Wormery. Mm. I think it's um, possibly 51 in the monthly range. Um, and, of course, she's appeared in Bernie Summerfield, possibly. Right. And she's, has, she has her own spin-off as well. Yeah. Do, do, have I got this right? Does she does she have a time-travelling bus? Yes, yeah, she's, she's, she's a time lord. Mm-hmm. And she has, a, she has a TARDIS, which is a bus, but it's smaller on the inside. <laughs> oh right okay oh, I love it already right okay yes I definitely want to be listening to those yeah. then yeah her first story was I forget the name but it was a it was an 8th Doctor BBC book story ah right okay I'm pretty sure there's a story out there with Iris and Joe that rings a bell now that you mention it is that relatively recent yeah 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 yes I think I've come across that on my wanderings on the Big Finish website Oh, the new website. I find it a bit hard to navigate. All right, I think I, I think I've got the hang of it now. Yeah. But that'd be really interesting to to listen to in terms of to see how Kitty Manning performs those two characters. I think I, I think that I may I may make it my first uh, my first one to listen to actually. Yeah. So this story introduces the third Doctor as well um, by Tim Trello. And he has done third Doctor stories as mm-hmm. well. For big finish, does it make you want to check those out? Uh, yes, it does. But I know that he and I—I I mean, all, all due respect to Tim Trilo, because uh, I think he does uh, a decent job of um, performing the Third Doctor and sounding a bit like John Pertwee. Because I know with those uh, Third Doctor adventures, because um, it's him and Katie Manning. Uh, I've got to say, it's more Katie Manning that would make me want to listen to those than perhaps Tim Trilo. Um, and I think, I mean, this is no fault of his own. I think what it is, it's because unfortunately we are aware that, you know, John Pertwee passed away in 1996. So we are aware that we're not listening to the, the man himself. Um, and I, I think there's, there's an element of being aware of that and being quite sad because it'd just be amazing if, if the man was still alive and, and being able to perform these audio adventures. But yeah, um, um so it's just. It's something at the moment I can't get past, but that's that's more of a problem with me than I think it is with the actor, because I think he actually, you know, I think he does a really good job, because not only is he uh, impersonating uh, John Pertwee to the best of his abilities, but he's also doing a performance as well. Uh, he's not doing a carbon copy uh, in that sense, which I think is probably the best thing to do. He's not the only one getting away with it. We've also got David Bradley doing exactly the same thing. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's true. But we also have um, someone out there doing performances of the 11th and 12th Doctor as well. Oh, right. Okay. Which is a bit odd. Yeah, yeah. that is a bit odd. I, I can see how the desire to to do to do the stories, uh, even though you haven't got the the actors who are still around and potentially will, could John Big finish later on. It's it's the idea of telling the stories comes first. So I can kind of get that. Um Oh, it's a bit funny. I think... Um... Where do you think it all falls morally? Because 
it kind of falls into the same argument of um, the time we had Peter Cushion back on screen for <laughs> Rogue One. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Um, that's a good question. I think... I don't know, because funny enough, this did, they did, this did start to make me think about it, because... I mean, we're very fortunate that a lot of the original actors are still are still with us, but um, but obviously there'll come a point when you know because we we all pass away. Wh- where does where does this end? Will there come a point where um, we will get someone who will later on um, try and try and play Joe Grant when Katie Manning's no longer with us, or try and do a Kate Stewart or an Osgood when the original, you know, so. On. I'm not sure. I mean, for example, with um, I mean, going back, <laughs> I'm going to mention another certain uh, science fiction TV series. When, uh, for example, Blake Seven, because Paul Darrow, who played Avon, sadly passed away earlier this year. Um, Big Finish have said that obviously they're rescheduling some of the Blake Seven audio adventures. They're yeah. going to rewrite um, a certain part three. Part three. The, the, the... Yeah. Yeah. Of uh, of what uh, of the latest box set that'll be it'll be rewritten, but they've got absolutely uh, no plans to recast the role of Avon. Um. Which is interesting, and I think because in that sense, because he was an actor who so was indel he re- he was so indelibly linked with that character, and it was sort of uh, the the actor and the performance m- matched so perfectly. I think it's one of those things where well, you can't really recast that part without rewriting the character uh but then this goes back to what what we're doing here with um oh, i'm really not sure i mean at the same i think i think it's more of a problem when you're using their li- visual likeness as you mentioned mm-hmm. with rogue one and peter cushing uh i think you've stepped over a line there uh i'm not too sure what are your thoughts on it well with the peter cushing thing of course Star Wars is this big commercial machine and if Peter Cushion had been alive now he might not have wanted to do it, he might have had a lot of resentment towards it and it, I think it does violate their choice. Maybe this should be an um, acceptable time frame like 100 years or so, you know I mean that's not unreasonable when it becomes a, when it becomes historic. Well I think what's going to be interesting now is that we're going to be we're now living in a world where an actor may potentially have to write in their will whether they are happy for their image to be used in the future or not. Yeah. And then they come and then the if we go down that route which you know seems perfectly reasonable then it's sort of like well what happens to actors who have passed away before that was then suggested that that would have to be written into their will. Um, so yeah, you, you've you've got a point there. You know, th- you're using the image of Peter Cushing, whether he would have you know liked to or not. And I think that the other issue is that is because really, um, they didn't need Peter Cushing to visually appear in that story in order for it to work. Um, that was just a sort of you know that could have easily been rewritten around. Whereas with Big Finish. Um, you either do one or two things. You either do a sort of, I don't know, like a companion's chronicle where you're hearing the entire perspective from the companion's point of view if the original actor who played the companion uh, is is performing it. Or you do, of course, what they've done here, which is uh, get another actor to impersonate um, the voice actor. I think with Doctor Who, in comparison to Star Wars, with Doctor Who, it's going to be done with the deepest respect isn't it because although um, money is made from these things Doctor Who isn't necessarily written for the money if you know what I mean so it's done, it's done out of respect and I think everyone will appreciate that yes and I think actually what's interesting is that Big Finish didn't rush into doing this it, this is only something that is, is, is appeared relatively recent and I think obviously because I think that is I think that's down to the respect of the original actor in this case John Pertwee um and also wanting to do him justice by getting a good actor who tries to emulate John Pertwee without being disrespectful and, and maybe going down the, the, the you know the route of potential parody. It feels respectful. And I suppose the fact that, I mean, because John Pertwee was a, 
you know, a very close friend for Katie. I don't want to put words into her mouth, but I'm just assuming. Because John Pitwee was a very close personal friend of Katie Manning and meant, meant and means an awful lot to her, as we've seen in, uh, in interviews over the years. Um, I think that if she, if she wasn't happy with his decision, then she wouldn't have been involved. Yeah, exactly. A kind of um, a very um, presence in the story kind of validates it, doesn't it? Yeah, and and I suppose, I mean, I don't know. They may have even approached uh, Sean, uh, John Pertwee's son, and going, you know, we're thinking of doing this. What do you, you know, are you happy for us to do this? Yeah, they must have had consent. Yeah, yeah. It's not the only instance in this story. We've got um, John Coleshaw playing the brig. Yeah, and that that was a that was a surprise because uh, within the within the stories, there's the whole thing of whether um, Kate Stewart will contact, uh, yeah. will actually speak to her father or not because they, um, Kate, Osgood and Joe are in the present, and then Kate and Joe because there's this um, this uh, temporal instability, this uh, time wormhole, they travel back in time to the early 1970s, and there's a possibility of Kate actually speaking to her father, uh, the Brigadier. And I actually thought that was it was something that they were perhaps just going to skirt around and maybe she would talk to him, but that would be off screen, as it were. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure where exactly that was going to go, but it was, it was a nice, um, it was a nice pleasant surprise that that conversation does actually happen and, and you know, we're privy to part of it. Yeah, and it was so brief that you didn't have time to see any flaws in it. It seemed um, very well performed, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it did. Believable, yeah. Mm-hmm. It seemed like better closure than the whole cyber break thing. <laughs> We're never going to let that drop, are we? Uh, no. no. Yes, it did. I think this is, I think this is, a, this is a lot better. Because actually, I think, uh, I mean, obviously the, the, the whole legacy of time, because just as a reminder for, for our listeners... Uh, Rob and I uh, haven't listened to the whole thing yet. We're reviewing the episodes um, as we're going along. So, but obviously we're aware that the whole story, the legacy of time, is to do with um, time instability, wormholes and things going wrong with time. And it, so even though that's that's what the whole thing is about, it seems to be linked up with these, uh, with these individual stories, which can be enjoyed into themselves, but will form uh, a collective whole by the time we get to the final episode, which is interestingly also written by Guy Adams. Ah. Um, so we know it's all connected, but we can't quite see any tangible links yet, can we? No, no, not yet. Um, but what I, the way that I saw this was that I thought that The Sacrifice of Joe Grant was a much simplified version of The Split Infinitive. Because it has the, the same idea in the sense that, you know, you've, you've got these, um, these temporal instabilities... Um, which is one event, but because it's linked with time, it takes place over multiple time frames. But it's yeah. one event. Um, and that was explored in the Split Infinitive, but what we see in that story is one concurrent story taking place in two decades. Whereas this is just much more, it just seems like a much more simplified version of that, where that's explained and forms part of the narrative but to me it's not really the main thrust of it no. to, to me the main focus on this story is the relationships between the characters and the emotion of it would you agree with that yes totally yeah we get some great moments in the story and i think um because initially i thought oh, this is this is uh, i'm enjoying i'm enjoying it and particularly with that introduction scene where they're at a um a water park uh, which I thought was a was a nice scene. I actually thought that um, we've sort of been here before, simply because of that comparison. Um, but this is just told in a slightly different way, a bit more accessible, if you like. Yeah. But for me, it was it was when we. I think it's pretty much. I mean, for me, the the second half of the episode is when it really uh, gets into his own and shows its strengths, and that's when we have. Joe, from her point of view, uh, seeing her doctor for the first time in 40-odd years, and th- that doctor, who's who's probably only known um, Joe for a few months at, the, at that point in his life, is seeing her much older, and you've got that 
their relationship going on. You've got the whole thing to do with Kate and does she contact her father and talk to him and all that. Uh, and it really sort of builds the emotion up toward, you know, th- towards the end of the episode. Totally. We'll have another character in the story by, played by Nick Briggs, Lieutenant Wallace. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if he's been in un- the unit stories before because we were, we were told that he's met the Doctor before. Oh, right, yes. D- which Doctor do you think it is? Because I was just wondering, because um, he mentioned something about being offered lemon sherbet. Oh. But I was just wondering if that, w- if that was a bit of a clue. I think that, I thought that was, did he meet the fourth Doctor? But then, given that that's supposed to be the present, that wouldn't make any sense. No. So did- maybe um, a current Doctor. Yeah, did Matt Smith have lemon sherbets? I don't know. Someone should let us know. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone know? Let us know. When um when the speaking to this Lieutenant Wallace played by Nick Briggs, they mention that the travel between these time holes it seems to be one way travel, um, and the people that have came through are stranded. They've got some sixteenth century peasants. Mm-hmm. This reminded me of um Torchwood End of Days. Do you remember back in series one, when um people from time, people have kind of fallen through time. Ah, oh, I forgot. I forgot about that. Uh, yes, and they had like a they had like a Roman soldier locked up, and people were walking around and um, passing on the Black Death, things like that. Ah, oh, right. Yes. No, I completely forgot about that. No, what it reminded me of. Have you ever seen the Doctor Who story, The Awakening? Uh, yes, a do long you... time ago. I do have the DVD, but yeah, uh, do you uh, remember the character Will, uh, who's from the 16th century? Or the 18th, something like that. But anyway, sort of like he pops up. It reminded me of that a bit. All right. Um, but that was, I thought that was a good idea. But what was, what was really uh, creepy? I mean, because I think Guy Adams on the whole, is what he's done here is provide a, a largely uh, enjoyable uh, and emotional story. But there are some really creepy ideas thrown in. And one of them is um, because this temporal instability uh gets stronger and basically anything it touches it taps into the history of it and brings these things back to life so it begins with you know bringing a dinosaur back which is oh, yes. sort of sort of fun but then later on when when, when it heads towards uh, the church and the graveyard you have all these you know this idea of you know the the you know the, the dead coming back to life um but there'll be some people still trapped in their coffins or under the earth unable to dig themselves out so they're alive but they're trapped in there Yes, and not only are the the ones beneath trapped, but the ones the ones above, well, the the they've been brought back, but they're still alive. Yeah. This this reminded me of Miracle Day, and of course, after the end of this story, um, Unit has to deal with this, doesn't it? Don't they? Yeah, yeah. That's something that um, we don't get to see, but it's quite grim and interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, that. What that's brought about is because uh, the Doctor had managed to find a way of um, dealing with this wormhole, but it would take about five hours for it to close up and, and all the rest of it. But then um, someone impersonates Osgood and tells yeah. Kate to muck about with the with the, the machinery, which causes this uh, the temporal instability to go uh, to go wild and bring the people back from the dead. And it's sort of like well. And again, we are left with this question in this story because the, the the previous, I mean, in lies in, lies in ruins. The whole question is, what what's going on? What why do we have um, the, you know the, the, this uh, peculiar form of a TARDIS? Then the split infinitive. It's well, who who is punching? And with this, it's who is impersonating God Osgood? What, is it the sirens? Do we go back to that that sort of tantalizing uh, hint? In lies and ruins, that it's the the sirens of time. I mean, we don't know. There's a lot of what I quite like about these things is that these are stories which can be enjoyed in themselves, and they, you know, there's something wrong with time, and it seems to be fixed. But then there's these little questions that get thrown up, and it goes, well, that remains to be answered. Well, when Kate receives the radio call from supposedly Osgood, the imposter, yeah. Um, we hear this ominous kind of music. Um, I think we've heard that before in Lies and Ruins, possibly. Mm-hmm. And I could be imagining it, but I feel like I heard a little inkling of some music from Trial of the Time Lord, like the tolling bells and the organ sounds. You know, you know the opening scene, mm-hmm. the iconic one of approaching the space station in yeah. Trial. Yes, I almost heard that, 
Oh, okay. I need to go back and listen to that then. Right, okay, that's interesting. I don't know. It was just a little inkling, and I, I played it back, and I could still kind of hear it. Mm-hmm. Like it was like this extra little bit of depth, depth to the music. When Kate is speaking to the imposter Osgood, mm-hmm. there's a moment where she hears screaming on the radio too. Yes, <laughs> not at all creepy. I love the contrast between Joe and Kate. You know, when they the first travel through, and Kate's the more active one because she she's the leader of unit. Uh, but Joe, when she goes through, she's more laid back about the whole thing. You know, she's, even though they've, they've just fell through time, she's kind of happy to get on with it, and Kate is kind of fretting about it. You know, she's quite concerned. Um, and given that, well, I thought that was interesting, you know, the difference between them. Joe's more laid back, you know, like, oh, this is an adventure. It'll all get sorted out. Let's just crack on with it. Yeah. That was, a, that was a good comparison between them. No, I, th- I think you're right. I think that is a very good comparison to, uh, to them. And I think, uh, that sh- you know, even though it's been 40 odd years since uh, Joe was last traveling in the TARDIS, um, you know, she has that experience and those memories. And she was thrown in, you know, much worse situations than this, arguably. Um, but also it's, it's a good reflection of her character in general. You know, she was very good at, you know, just getting mucked in and, and dealing with the situation. Um, uh, Kate Stewart... Uh, is obviously very strong and, and capable and all the rest of it, but she is a lot, as we've seen on the television series and here, she is a lot more earnest. It was great seeing her reunited with the Doctor, though, as well. Um, funny thing here, though, the Doctor now has some foreknowledge. Um, you know, it was a bit about Joe's future, uh, her marriage. Um, you know, was he'll regain use of the TARDIS one day. Mm-hmm. Um, but especially later on when they go to the pub for some food, um... That's another great scene, by the way. But she mentions her husband's name. She mentions all our kids. Um, how do you think this affects the final scene from the Green Death? Because in that scene, the whole engagement in the Green Death that really comes in a kick, comes out a kick to the face of the Doctor, doesn't it? Because like he's a bit set back and he he kind of walks out the back door, drives off into the sunset. Mm-hmm. But now we know that he he can see it coming. True. I mean, I, I think that. I think it's one of those things that could be explained. Well, it would still, it would still emotionally affect him anyway, because at that point, you know, th- they've become firm friends and have gone through an awful lot, and it would still, it would still have that. Even though he can see it coming, the fact that it's it still happened would still would still affect him. Yeah. So for you, this doesn't affect the Green Death in any way. Um, it does a little bit, if I'm going to be honest. I suppose I could explain it and by the way that I just have but I, in my personal preference would be um what we see in the green death is 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 how it happens he doesn't have that foreknowledge because I think um I and mean, don't get me wrong I do like the sacrifice of Joe Grant and I, I'm not going to quibble of whether it's canon or not because I can't be bothered mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> it's just a, you know it's a good story it, you know I'm happy if it'd be considered canon or the rest of it but personal preference would be um I like I like the Green Death as it appears. Um, I mean, but then at, at the same time, you could argue that within the confines of the Green Death, the Doctor has that foreknowledge that things are going in that direction anyway. Because in the very first episode of the Green Death, you know, Joe Grant is is seen as uh, going on her own way, and then the Doctor even goes, "So the fledgling flies the coop." So it's sort of written within the confines of the st- within the story itself that he can kind of see it's going. In that direction, that should be leaving soon, and yet when it happens, it's it's still a he still finds it emotional. Yeah. Although, um, in this story, when Joe tells the Doctor that she's going to die, mm-hmm. the Doctor's like, "Oh, you know what? That doesn't need to happen." Mm-hmm. So he has a more carefree outlook on um, causality, possibly, doesn't he? Right. I'll tell you something. Right, which uh, which really bugs me in relation to this. Uh, uh, this isn't any. This isn't a dig at Guy Adams um, at all. This is uh, this is just a look at the sort of thing where it it's happened a lot in the new series. But it's this look of going. Um, well, if the Doctor's companions are are, are potentially going to die because he travels in time, uh, he can he can deal with that, which is fine. It makes sort of sense. But the problem that it raises with me is why doesn't he do that for Adric? 
Maybe he sensed that it was meant to happen. There must be something he knows that we don't. He must believe it was part of events. But I mean, um, <laughs> but but it doesn't. To me, it doesn't sort of equate with this sort of thing. So, if um, Capaldi would have saved him, yeah, possibly. But then, <laughs> but then I'm I much prefer I much prefer it when uh, when you've got a companion like Adric dies because it show one it's rare, but when it does happen, it shows that you know that the stakes are high with these adventures and this sort of thing can happen. Yeah. Um, having said that, though, uh, because I mean, for so example, I'm quite happy for for Adric to remain dead at the end of Earthshock because that's a you know it's, it's a very strong ending uh, for that character and the end of that story, Earthshock. Uh, when it comes to the Peter Capaldi era, when um, Clara dies at uh, face in Face the Raven, she should have stayed dead. Uh, that would have been a great ending for her character and I think that's what should have happened personally. I don't like what happens when he's brought back in the narrative and all the rest of it. Mm. Having said that though, uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not consistent with this point at all because when it comes to the sacrifice of Joe Grant, at the end when it looks like uh, Joe is about to die and it's just like, oh no. And when she's brought back, it's like, yes, get in. Um yes. So I'm not really consistent with the point, but I suppose it really depends on the character and how it's written and so on. I suppose yeah. that had Clara come back in a much better written story, I would I wouldn't have had a problem with it. Yeah. Uh, this is a uh, I think this is really well written, and it does yeah. take it does take you on that journey of going, oh crap, is she going to die or not? Yeah. And you're sort of relieved, <laughs> and I, I mean that she isn't, and I think also because Joe Grant is a really lovable character as well. I love how you just compared it with Clara. Like when Joe, when Joe comes back, we just punch the sky. Yes, and then we're like, "Oh God, Clara's back." The following week, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, "Oh, for God's sake!" I mean, yeah. uh, I'm not a massive fan of Clara. <laughs> I don't know no. whether that come across. I mean, but at the same time, I don't think she was awful. Um, no. I just think they went a bit too far with certain aspects. But you know, I quite like the character. If, if truth be told, I just, I think it just would have been much better. Um, had she stayed dead, but if you yeah. do, if you do, if you do reverse that drama and bring her back, um, I mean, this is down to personal taste. I just don't like that story where she's brought back. That's the that's the that's the the thing. Mm. But, but then this... I, I, li- I liked seeing what bringing her back did to the Doctor, though. Yes, the, his reasons for it. I think more. F- more for seeing the Doctor than the Clara. Yeah. You know? Although having said that, though, it does give us a. I think which is generally one of the great scenes in Doctor Who. It's that moment when they're in the cloisters, and Clara realizes that you know, hang on, how old are you? How how long have you endured this? And when she finds out, you know, when she tells the Time Lords that they are hated, that is a fantastic scene. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how it's written and how it's performed, I do really like that. I think that I think that's sterling. Uh, but then I suppose maybe another thing is you know with Bill. At the end of the uh, Peter Capaldi era, she yeah. gets turned into Cyberman, which is devastating. Oh yeah. Uh, and what they and what they do um, with that as the, as the story unfolds is just amazing, and it's it's emotional and it's 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 horrible. I mean that in the best way, uh, and it's it's great. And they seem to follow their convictions with that. But when they bring her back, um. I mean, because I love the character of Bill, and I would, I would have loved to have perhaps seen her just carry on, not as a Cyberman, but I mean, just as in general, like if if we had a companion going into carrying over into a new Doctor, because uh, I don't think we've seen that since Rose. Actually, I may be wrong. Um, I think that would have been quite good. Maybe seeing Bill paired up with Jodie Whittaker would have been quite nice. Um, Maybe. But um, the fact that they bring her back after what they've done. Uh, I just think it weakens the drama. Yeah. Well, even even the very last moments of the Cyberman story, mm-hmm. where, was it World Enough in Time? Yeah. Um, she's brought back to life there as well. Mm-hmm. It's like they go through this horrific thing, like she's been converted into a Cyberman. She's not just inside the suit. You know, where I think there's a scene where Nardole says he's going to kick her ass, and she says, well, you have to go find it. It's in a bucket somewhere. And that reminds you that, okay, she's... She's been. She's really been converted. There's not much of her left, you know. Yeah, I mean, because that's a that's a line that's both funny and horrible. It, yeah. Yeah. 
uh, I think yeah because that was yeah exactly and uh, I thought that was uh, very very well written um, very well performed and, and all the rest of it yeah and you know that's tragic and that's that's life mm-hmm. and then you, you then you have this thing that kind of defies belief a little bit yeah when of course she's the her girlfriend from the puddle comes back <laughs> yeah. and gives gives her the option to fully come back to life, you know, mm-hmm. down to every atom, and then of course she comes back with the um, the glass avatars. So, mm. but in terms That's of this story, yeah, yeah. But in terms of this story, the sacrifice of Joe Grant, it's you kind of go through that emotional uh, roller coaster, if you like, but uh, it's just absolutely joyous at the end of it when. Um, you know, when uh, the Doctor did end up saving Joe. One thing that I thought maybe they were going to hint at, but they but they didn't actually do it. It was a lot more simpler. But I was wondering if... Because um, I thought what they were maybe going to do was, you know, when uh, at the end of Planet of the Spiders, uh, just before the... So when the Doctor arrives back in unit, uh, and just before he collapses, he says that he was lost in the time... Vortex, and I think he's I think he's been away for about two weeks or something. I thought maybe what 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 they were going to say was during that two weeks that was when he um that's when that's when he saved Joe. I like that idea. Um, all right, okay, no, because uh, so I th- I thought that was maybe what they were going to hint at, but 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 the, but they didn't. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd, I just thought I'd mention it. Oh, I know you mentioned the dinosaur on the cliff side. Um, how did he visualize that? Because I visualized it like um, invasion of the dinosaurs. I love that story, but yeah, do you mean in terms of the uh, yeah the visual the, style, the, yeah, style the, of it? Yeah, yeah. The, oh, did you did, did you weren't thinking like some scene out of Jurassic World? Were you? Oh. <laughs> well, that was yeah, very very cinematic. All right, I, yeah, I was yeah. thinking a bit. I was thinking the big a big toy dinosaur <laughs> kind of superimposed on the scene. You know? Oh, okay. So you were actually placing it in period, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. No, I was. Uh, no, I was I was just imagining this this big dinosaur in sort of like Jura- Jurassic Park type thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, but maybe I should have yeah maybe I should have imagined it as a as a big rubber monster. So I like the bit when um, the doctor suggests going out for lunch. It reminded me of the podcast last week when we were talking about Remembrance of the Daleks, and that we'll have these great scenes in the cafe, mm-hmm. which um, which I was saying kind of seemed like filler but it, it seemed fine at the same time and in this story we get the we get to see the doctor going out for a pub meal with joe mm-hmm. and just sitting down and talking yeah um which is great because usually the only the only kind of um interactions we get with the characters is in the action or in the narrative of the story mm-hmm. um so it was it was great to get get them to just sit down and talk wasn't it Yes, that that was, and uh, for me, this is because I thought, because um, I've got to be honest, it's sort of of the the three episodes that we've listened to so far, I think this is perhaps my least favorite. Although when you say that, I, it's a bit irritating that you've got to say this, but I feel that like, you know, even though I say it's my least favorite, I still absolutely love it. Yeah. Um, but what happened was sort of like the way that it began. I thought, yeah, this is a perfectly decent story. For me, it was it was when we had this scene in the pub. This is when, for me, it's like when the episode started to shine and it was like, right, now I'm really gripped and this is really good stuff. Um, and yeah, that, that that nice really, that nice character uh, interaction between Joe and the Doctor with just sitting in a pub and ordering a meal and having a meal uh, because, you know, you, you've got the emotional, uh, emotions of the character and they're learning about each other. Um and it's about it's about that little thing which now and again crops up in the series, but it's how the doctor becomes better, or or still despite his age learns through his companions, uh, and, and we get that in this interaction. And it's really rather nice. And I love when um, Joe says um, she may have found the one thing in the universe that really scares the doctor, <laughs> and but he thinks it's children. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, but in fact, it's responsibility. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the doctor suggests getting uh, beef wellington. And Joe forgot that he wasn't a vegetarian. Mm-hmm. And I find it's interesting that she seems to remember him being vegetarian. But he wasn't. 
but now he might consider it. Do you think he's possibly... Do you think this is kind of a bit of a paradox here, the way she's remembering him being a vegetarian after this meal? Or was this a reference to some continuity issue that I don't know about? Uh, no, I think I think it's just something a lot more simpler, which is um, that what it is is that the the events of the Green Death, which is with the exception of Death of the Doctor, is when the last time Joe saw the Doctor, uh, and that obviously changed her um, her perception with certain things. I mean, we, we see it in that story where she's appalled by the the idea of eating eggs and baking and eating black pudding, which is fair enough because the idea is just absolutely revolting. Um, yeah. But obviously, she, she ends up having a different life when she she marries um, uh, Professor Jones, uh, yeah. and obviously they, they become vegetarians at that point. And that adventure obviously had a massive impact. And I suppose it would be one of those things where it's just one of those things that, oh, I forgot you weren't a vegetarian. I just saw it in, in relation to that um, rather than a continuity thing. Because I think in terms of the show, the only time the Doctor ever says that he's a vegetarian is uh, following the resu- uh, following the events of the two Doctors. And that's the Colin Baker era. Ah, uh, right, okay. Uh, I think also in some of the books he's been, uh, he's been vegetarian on and off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'm vegetarian myself, um, and um, I'm wondering here, is Joe perhaps being a bit inappropriate by guilting the Doctor about um, his respect for life while eating meat? <laughs> well, because I feel like I'm more respectful of people by not making them feel guilty when they're eat- eating their food. <laughs> well, no, you're, you're very good, because you're, you're a vegetarian, uh, and I'm not. Um, and, you know, we respect each other's uh, choices. I think that's the thing of sort of like forcing your viewpoint on someone else. By all means, talk about it and maybe consider it. And you could argue that that's what Joe is doing here. Uh, but yeah, I was just listening, listening going, eat the beef wellington for God's sake, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's what I do. He um, seems a bit good, doesn't he, when he's like, okay, I'll have the veggie pie. <laughs> um, one thing that I found a bit inconceivable here, uh, well, uh, unimaginable, is that a pub in the 70s has a veggie pie option. Now, growing up in the 90s, it was quite impossible to get veggie pub grub. And now it's a lot more accessible, like, now that we're in this decade now. Mm-hmm. Um, but never mind the last. But I feel I feel like it's very... It, it's, it, I don't think it would have happened, you know? <laughs> I think you've actually got a point. Because, I mean, when you, I think it's absolutely staggering how, how slow it is to actually just get decent vegetarian options in restaurants. Uh, it's a lot better now, especially with the whole, the whole vegan craze that's going on. Um, yeah. But yes, I, I remember a lot less cheeses were vegetarian in the nineties. Now it's a lot better now. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, the packaging's a lot more clear. Ingredients are getting changed. And yes, when when you go out when you go out to a restaurant, I'm usually limited to about three options or something. You know, there might there might be one of the pastas, one of the pizzas, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still very limited, but it's getting better. Yeah, it is getting better. And it's, I mean, yeah, it, it, as you said, it's a lot better than what it used to be. And uh, I mean, because even though I'm not a vegetarian, it doesn't mean that I want to eat meat all the bloody time. Um, so, yeah, just when get you, the beef wellington. Just get the, just get the beef wellington. Just, from, from now on, I'm going to make a point, Rob, and eat nothing but beef wellingtons. Uh, and then get fat and die. Um, but, uh, but die happy. No, um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Vegetarian options are a lot are a lot better if you if you compare them to as you say what it was like in the nineties. But still, it's still pretty meager. It's it's like um, and I think uh, I think probably vegans struggle an awful lot, I, uh, especially I think in Britain because I remember um, it'd be interesting to see if there's any um, listeners from the continent because I remember when I visited um, Germany for the first time. It was in Frankfurt uh, quite a few, uh, few years ago now. Um, and I was quite impressed with the amount of uh, places that had um, vegan menus. That's interesting. You know, no disrespect, but I would have thought the opposite. Ah, oh, I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, when you yeah, I know what you mean. Just with the culture. Yeah, um, yeah, and especially you know, you know, for what uh, German cuisine so famous for. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I get that. Um, so I was quite um, I was quite surprised, but then it may be the case that it's just marginally better to than what it is in Britain. And maybe you've got vegans in Germany going like, "Are you kidding? It's it's it's, it's not all that." Um, you know, we we only have an option of two things on the menu if we're lucky. Yeah, 
Um, and there's another thing in, in France. I mean, I can only go by one thing I've read in the news, <laughs> but um, it might not be true now. It might or it might not be true to a certain extent. But um, um, meals for kids in schools. I was reading that the don't tolerate it being a vegetarian. So if your child's a vegetarian, um, they have to eat meat at school. That's um, so, that strikes me as nonsense. Or at least I, yeah. I mean, if it's true, it, I'd be absolutely appalled. But I, it, I feel like it's the norm. Yeah, from what I read. What? Oh. That's 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 disappointing. I mean, um, do, I mean, because you've got kids, so when. Do you prepare? Do you prepare their meals? Do you give them packed lunches for school, or um, or other vegetarian there's options? And a, a bit of both. There's, there is vegetarian options, mm-hmm. and there's been multiple occasions where, when my daughter's been too young to say otherwise, they've gave they've gave her the meat option, and she's ate it. She's had like fish fingers, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but did they know that uh, she was vegetarian? Oh yes, yeah, so you do remind them, and they just forget, you know, and. Mm-hmm. It, it's awkward because just because she's vegetarian, I feel like it's not enough of an argument for them, you know. Um, all, all they can do is say, "Oh, sorry," you know. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I suppose it's not deliberate, but at the same time, it's it's. Uh, I suppose in this day and age, it's it's really not good enough. No, you would. I feel like if it if it was for religious reasons, I would. It. I feel like in their in their eyes, I would have had more of an argument. Well, I think it's. I think. Well, actually, you're raising an interesting point because I think. Uh, I think a lot of schools do find it easier providing um, dietary requirements for religious reasons. So, you know, there's a number of schools that provide uh, halal uh, meat. Um, I'm much more aware of that than pr- providing kosher from from right. what I've read. And that's fine. They're, they're you know, they're... Especially, they're... I'd imagine if you go down south, um, that would be um, to a greater extent, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, just with the halal options, you know, especially if you go down south, like most of the McDonald's are, for example. Yeah, well, I know that because uh, I've got a friend of mine, and his his wife is a teacher, and she teaches in a, a school in um, in Fenham, which has a predominantly um, Muslim population. So, what the school does, and it makes sense given that the vast majority of um, the kids there come from from Muslim families, is that the the, the meals that they provide are halal meat. Um, so that makes sense, but I suppose I would have thought that in this day and age, because um, it's not as if it's a, a, an isolated pocket of people who eat uh, just vegetarian. It's a vast, yeah. you know, there's a significant number of people who who, who eat vegetarian. Uh, you would have thought that that would be something that easily catered for now. Could be to me personally. Um, I would never control my kids' diet. You know, only to a certain extent. I'd I'd um. There are vegetarian, the vegetarians now, um. But to me, for for me personally, it it's a big fundamental thing, you know, um. So it, it does hurt a little bit, you know, the fact that um, the they could be so um. Ignorant towards it. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, I mean, it's one of those things of going well. It's not as if you can provide diets for 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 everyone for that you know you know you can't. You wouldn't expect a school to provide, um, you know, the, the various different um, dietary requirements because you know um, t- to cover every single eventuality, there obviously has to be um, an element of, of practicality, which I think you know most people would use their common sense and go, well, yeah, okay, that's fine. But I would have thought that um, providing vegetarian meals would fall in would fall into well, we're very easy, you know, we can very easily provide that. Yeah. And especially as like what I've said before is, it's not as if you're talking about a niche, um, quarter of the populace where it's like, well, I'm sorry, but you know we've got a, we've got a whole school here and it's only one per, you know, it's no. I would have thought that'd be very easy to to accommodate. Yeah, especially since it can be, it can be nice food that everyone can eat. You know, like jack and potatoes or things like that. Yeah, exactly. It's it's um you can you can it doesn't have to just be cauliflower <laughs> cheese every day just because you're a vegetarian. You can have. A vast uh, variety of vegetarian dishes. Yeah, uh, it's because me, me eaters do eat vegetables, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I can vouch for that. Uh, we, we do eat vegetables now and again. 
No, we, we do, yeah. And as I said, I don't eat meat every every single day and with every single meal. It's, it's, it's not it's not essential, but yeah. No. Um, during the meal with the doctor, Joe gives quite a good speech about her optimism. How you know, in spite of all the bad people in the world, she still thinks the world's quite an amazing place. Mm-hmm. So that that's great. That kind of optimism that she has, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like a good like good outlook quite cool <laughs> yeah we don't all have that no no we don't but you know maybe we should it's not all doom and gloom there are obviously yes. things that need to be improved upon but you know it's yeah. uh it's not all dour so after the pub scene um kate is speaking with osgood the imposter mm-hmm. but then we also have a, a scene following that with osgood in the present day did you click on that it wasn't Osgood? Uh, uh, sorry did you click on that it wasn't osgood at this stage yeah, I thought I thought it was uh, I thought it was very obvious. I thought there was something a bit ominous, and then the way that it was cutting um, from when from when Kate was supposed to be hearing from Osgood, and then when we're cutting to the present, when when he when we were actually hearing Osgood and what she was doing, there there was a disconnect. So I thought, yes, oh, I thought it was obvious. Yeah, it was an impersonation. Uh, did yeah, you? Because it, oh yes, because it's very clear that similarly to the split infinitive, this story, um, the two timelines are transparent at the same time so mm-hmm. yeah it should all sync up you know so yes it definitely wasn't our osgood mm-hmm. um and the doctor's quite annoyed with kate isn't he but it's cool that he all of a sudden cottons on that oh it must maybe it was an imposter someone was Im- imitating osgood but um kate must feel quite guilty mustn't she yeah, she must be low. Well, yeah, and I think because that, that that's uh, that's handled in quite a nice scene because when Kate actually explains the reason why she did that and the Doctor goes, oh, you've been tricked and that's quite understandable. And then she's sort of like, I feel such a fool. But then the Doctor and Joe are basically, you know, I think it's mainly Joe actually. Um, because I think this is, I, you could actually argue it's, it's in the title of the story. But uh, this is really Joe's story. Um so even though the doctor's involved, he's not he's not really the main character. It's it, this is all Joe's story. So she's she's really the one who I think takes control and is trying to console Kate and goes, you know, it's 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 not a problem. We understand, you know, we all make mistakes. It's fixable. Everything's hunky dory. And I mean, he would um, he would trust one of his companions, just like Kate trusts Osgood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So he could fall for the same trap. Mm-hmm. Um. Joe tells the doctor that she's met other hymns, later hymns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, who has she met? Obviously, she's met Matt Smith in the death of the doctor in the Sarah Jane Adventures. Yeah. Um, but it was a bit vague in that story. Um, she was kind of half implying that she hadn't met any other regenerations. Mm-hmm. D- did you get that from the death of the Do- death of the doctor? Because she says, oh, th- who is that? Is that, is that? is that the Doctor? Is that my Doctor? And she says, well, I knew they could regenerate, but in, into a child, <laughs> into a baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so I, I got the implication there that this was her second Doctor, Matt Smith. Yes, that, that's, um, yeah, yeah, that's what I got from it. So well. has she met more Doctors since? I wonder. But nothing you're aware of, no? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. No. She must have met other Doctors in um, other spin-off media. Maybe the books. Oh, possibly. Or other, or other audios, yeah. Yeah. I know that... Um, I think she's done an audio adventure with... Um, Sylvester McCoy, I think. But is she playing Joe in that story? I think it's called Muse of Fire. All oh, right. We'll have to look that up. Yeah. Oh no, hang on. Sorry, I'm just on the big finished website now. Just had a look. No, she plays Iris in that one. Oh, okay. Well, she could be being very meta. You know, I've met other hymns, but but not as me, <laughs> as my <laughs> my other self. <laughs> Maybe. No, not at all. Um, she catches the Doctor off guard with a Venusian Aikido. Yes, I love that. I thought <laughs> I thought that was really good. Um. Yeah. You didn't know, see that coming. No, no, I didn't. And I thought that was that was really nice, nicely handled. The whole thing of going, no, 
you know, well, uh, we, le- <laughs> we learn from each other and there's something that I've learned from you. <laughs> How to karate chop you across the neck. Uh, yeah. I would love to have seen that. <laughs> I would have as well. That would have been great. Then, of course, we get the whole emotional scene when the when Kate and the Doctor see Joe sacrificing herself, going through, back through the, the time hole. That's quite um, it's quite sad because, it, of course, we're we're kind of believing it at this stage, aren't we? That this is the end. Yeah, and um, that there's a there's a scene where um, we actually hear Joe. Uh, uh, in the sort well, of she... the time vortex. And, you know, uh, some instances it's difficult to pick up what she's actually saying. But towards the end, it sounds like she's uh, in absolute agony. And it sounds like she's being torn apart. Oh, that's awful, yeah. Yeah. Um, She says that she's all alone and she says, it's so cold. Mm. Uh, Rhea said the same thing in Lies and Ruins. Ah, right, okay. I hadn't picked up on that. Oh, right, okay. That's interesting. Just before the, the siren was freed from the TARDIS. But yeah, the the scene of her supposedly dying alone was hard to listen to and sad, wasn't it? Yeah, mm, yeah. And it was nice that um, she got to read a letter from the Doctor. Yeah, that that that, uh, that was a nice uh, nice touch as well. And then we've got the the whole continuity sting at the end when um, Kate mentions some guiding force wanting to tear time apart. Time, yeah. time will tell, she says. I know, I was going to say, is it, are they going to fit it? Oh no, sure, they didn't no. go, and it always I know, goes. I was literally on the edge of my seat, edge and forward, and no, it didn't happen. No, it didn't happen. Maybe that was too obvious. But uh, yeah. Maybe we were meant to say that. <laughs> so the audience can join in. Oh, it's a bit of a pantomime at the end. <laughs> yeah. It always does. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, just to mention that last point, um, Katie Manning has done... Uh, an audio adventure with um, Sylvester McCoy's Seventh Doctor as Joe, so uh, it's called The Defectors. So she's done at least another. Uh, she's done at least one audio adventure uh, with another Doctor. I was wondering if she'd met another modern Doctor, but yeah, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, anyway. Uh, no, just occurred to me I haven't um, decided what to rate this story yet. <laughs> All right, okay. Have you got anything in mind? Um, I think I'll probably give it an eight. Any negatives? Um, not, not as such because as I said, I think it's a, I think it's a good episode and I do really enjoy it. It's just that I felt that um, it began, you know, fine. It was listenable. Uh, I thought it was a decent story, but where it really picks up is with the emotional, um. Uh, the emotional moments and the character interaction that takes place in the second half of the episode. That's when I thought that when it was really at its best. Um, And as I said, I think really, because even though these can be enjoyed individually, but they also form part of a a larger narrative of, of the three episodes that we've listened to so far. um, This is my least favorite. And that's not a fault of this episode. It's, it's, it's good, it's strong, there's an awful lot to like. But it comes down to the fact that, you know, Lies and Ruins, as we've said previously, it has a really big epic quality to it. Um, and it has a scale and a, an emotional resonance to it, which, uh, you know, just really appeals. The Split Infinitive for me is my favourite because, and it goes just down to personal taste, because it it, it, it has quite a, a Bond-esque... Um, thriller element to it with a lot of action and uh, I, I really like that sort of thing um, so it's it's just uh, it's just in, in comparisons I feel like the sacrifice of Joe Grant is is the weakest but that does but then that sounds negative I do really like the sacrifice of Joe Grant it's just the two episodes in comparison I think are better but I do agree with that um, did you feel like the sacrifice of Joe Grant felt like a quite a short story given the the pace of the narrative and um how many events there was you know yes i mean it, it rattled along at a, at a really good pace i mean it never flagged it uh, it wasn't boring i didn't feel like i had any padding to it so yeah it was it was it was written well it was directed well it sounded good and it was it was very engaging i think i suppose another thing as well it's um 
I wonder if going forward until the whole story realizes, am I going to start getting bored with the oh, it's another, it's another time anomaly. Yeah. Um, I wonder if at this point the whole, the way that they've structured, the episodes, rather than being sort of like a continuing a continuing narrative, it's sort of broken in with these different. Different characters experiencing the same time anomaly, but from different aspects. Am I gonna? Am I gonna start finding that a bit tedious? I don't know, but it's a concern that I have going forward. Oh, okay, so we'll see what happens next week. Oh, the next episode. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Not next week. Um, what is the next one? Let's just have a little look here. We've got relative time, and that um, a Peter Davison one. Did I say yes? Yes, it is. Yeah. Cool. With um. Oh, Georgia Tennant, her name is now. So she's got two... She had two real names and two actor names. So Georgia Moffat. Yep. But she acted as Georgia Davison. And now she's called Georgia MacDonald. But she's acting as Georgia Tennant. I was going to say where she got the MacDonald from, but then I realised that David Tennant's David real name is David MacDonald. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still think it's one of the uh, someone. I think I've already mentioned this in a previous podcast, but I did find it funny. There was a Doctor Who convention where they had there was a panel, and uh, <laughs> Peter Davison was one of them. And it was just going. Um, so someone in the audience asked Peter Davison, "What's uh, what's the strangest thing a fan's ever given you?" And then Sylvester McCoy went, "A granddaughter." <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. Oh. I mean, uh, it's just it's funny how that's worked out yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I feel like it wasn't big enough news like a lot of people just don't know do you remember um, I shared a news article with you recently um, and some some news outlet online had reported that this was like some new revelation <laughs> oh yes it wasn't all that long ago you said that as well yeah, yeah. it was just yeah it's yeah, and didn't they actually report it like it was uh, some big secret news? Yeah. Yeah. Um, family connection revealed. <laughs> it's like, we already knew. Yeah, and it's... They met and they found they got... Yeah, it was just... And I think what it was, wasn't it didn't... Wasn't it report because um, Peter Davison and uh, David Tennant were changing a light bulb in their house or something like that, and uh, Georgia Moffat had uh, tweeted it. And they took, and they, they took that as the thing of going... <gasps> We never knew this. My God, it's a scandal. Uh, yeah, that, that was a bit mad. But different surnames. It's like it's probably confusing for regular people. <laughs> <laughs> Moffat's, <Yeah>. McDonald's, and <laughs> yeah, it's unnecessary. Really. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, wait, is that his daughter or his <laughs> his wife? It's very confusing. For them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, do you think we should check out the Doctor's daughter? next week on the podcast I beg your pardon oh right I see what you mean um the episode uh yes yes we should so when did that come out it was series 4 2007 2007 2008 something like that yeah Isn't it? yeah it's a long time ago it was yeah I can actually remember watching it for the first time yeah blimey D- did you see it when, it when it was broadcast uh yes I did yeah yeah of course Martha was in that wasn't she as well Oh yeah, I completely forgot Martha is in that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm quite, quite excited now. Yeah, I mean, because well, I was looking for because um, Donna is one of my all-time favorite uh, companions, and I know I remember her uh, being in it, obviously, because it was series four. Um, and she worked. I mean, obviously, we'll look into this later, but I remember she works out what the the numbers mean. Um, but yes, I completely, oh, yes. For, I, I completely forgot Martha was in that one. Yeah, she is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's one busy yeah. lass. And she's back with big finish now. Yeah, that was a that was a, that was a big reveal. Yeah, um, I think everyone thought it might have been um, a story about her year in series three. Mm-hmm. The year she got, she spent alone on Earth. Ah, right. During, but during the sound of drums. Yeah, I, is it? Or do we not no, know it's yet? Not, no, it's not. It's um, just a tortured story. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Should we? Oh, um, Liam, should we do the predictive texting? Oh yes, we should. Uh, we're, we're trying to make this a thing of the right uh, of the podcast, but we actually forgot to do it last week. Um, so what it is is that we just do the staff thing, 
where we type in uh, the title of the story and see what our predictive text throws up. Um, so because we were supposed to do it last week, but we uh, for Remembrance of the Daleks, so we'll do that first. So uh, for me, what comes up is Remembrance of the Daleks was a little nervous about the tone of the email, but I told him to relax and carry on the rest of the week after the gym. As you may now. Right. Remembrance of the Daleks was the day going to be a tough day for for you, Law. Okay. Remembrance of the Daleks was the day going to be a tough day for you, Law. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Makes total sense. Okay. So I'll do the sacrifice of Joe Grant now. Okay, mine is the sacrifice of Joe Grant is to be a legend and give our instant reaction to the future of the Doctor. All right, okay. Um, am I doing the sacrifice of Joe Grant or the legacy of time? Oh, go on, do legacy of time. I love how every time I go to type in the legacy of time, it gives me an emoji of a leg. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. The leg. Oh, because uh, I made a start on the sacrifice of Joe Grant. Um, I can read that one out after, but because uh, that got a bit weird. Right. Um, the legacy of time is a little more than a couple of hours ago and I have been working on the train now for the last few days and thankfully the weather is very good and I have been very busy with work and the weather is nice. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, right, okay. <laughs> so I'll read that out again. The legacy of time is a little more than a couple of hours ago and I have been working on the train now for the last few days and thankfully the weather is very good and I have been very busy with work and the weather is nice. <laughs> uh, the one that came up with the sacrifice of Joe Grant, I don't know why it came up with a certain government department, but it has. So my predictive text came up with the sacrifice of Joe Grant is to be made to ensure that the Home Office is facing pressure to answer the following questions to, <laughs> to help you out with your personal information. <laughs> Since when do I text about the bloody Home Office? <laughs> Don't know what that one's about, but anyway, yeah, there we go. <laughs> did, uh, did you come up with a ranking for uh, Sacrifice of Joe Grant? Uh, no, I couldn't think of one, but... Um... I kind of agree with you, so I'll um, I'll go with your eight out of ten. Good man, we're in agreement. Yes. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I I just I agree to copy you. So. <laughs> Next week, though, I'll definitely write down a rating beforehand. Yeah, I'm looking forward to watching that because uh, I remember re- I really I remember liking the Hoth. So we'll do that next week, and then the following week we'll be on to relative time. Yep. Well, I think that's it for today. Thanks for listening. See you around. Yep. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.